All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's CryUEM Current Practices webinar. Uh, you're joining the three national centers established by the NIH Common Fund Transformative High Resolution Cryoelectron Microscopy Program. My name is Christina Zemanyi. I'm a scientist and training liaison at the National Center for CryUEM Access and Training, NCCAT. And uh, today I'm also your webinar moderator. I'm joined today by my colleague here at NCCAT Ed Eng, and um, also Theo Humphreys and Lauren Hales Beck from the Pacific Northwest CryoEM Center, PNCC, and Michael Schmidt from the Stanford Slack CryoEM Center, S2C2. Uh, S2C2 has invited today's speaker, Dr. Ashish Mangalik, and uh, Mike will introduce him properly uh, after my colleagues from each of the centers give a, a brief overview and update on the cryoEM resources uh, we offer at no cost to the research community. Uh, for those of you new to our webinar series, CryoEM Current Practices is an ongoing event that we host the last Thursday of every month at this same time. And uh, we uh, highlight particularly the methods that researchers are using to obtain an and interpret the data they can collect at the national centers. Uh, so plug for next month's talk, uh, James Chen and Brandon Malone uh, from the Rockefeller University will be presenting on uh, COVER all the bases, structural perspectives of SARS-CoV-2 RNA synthesis. Um, so you can save the date now for uh, that talk. Um, we are recording today's talk and you'll find the recording along with those from past talks on the events page at cryoemcenters.org, um, along um, with the registration link for upcoming talks and other general information about the larger NIH Common Fund Cryoem program. A couple of final logistics. We'll be using the Q&A feature for questions. Um, so you can ask your questions there and also upvote other questions that you see. Uh, if you have questions directed to logistics or access at the centers, our panelists will respond to those directly in that Q&A box, and we'll save questions for Ashish for the end of his talk. Um, and with that, I will turn over to the representatives from each of the centers, and Ed is up first. Take it away. Hey. Hello, and I'm here at New York City, where NCCAT is housed. And we offer dedicated instrument access for high-end instrumentation on one of our four previous instruments, as well as a cross-training program. Right now, we have an upcoming call for proposals July 1st, but given the July 4th holiday, we'll accept some uh, applications a little bit later. Something to note right now, we are open for business and especially on-site access. So if you wanna spend a couple of days in New York for your CREOS access, or a few weeks for your embedded cross-training, we welcome you here to the Big Apple. Hope to see you soon. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Theo, you are up next. Hello, everyone. My name is Theo Humphreys, and I work as a scientific point of contact for the Pacific Northwest Cryo-EM Center, um, or PNCC. At this time, we offer one proposal type for both single particle analysis and tomography, and that grants you up to 480 hours of microscope time a year for up to two years. At the PNCC, we have a monthly submission deadline for applications, um, and each approved proposal will be delegated a scientific point of contact, such as myself, to help answer scientific questions. Uh, the PNCC has five microscopes. We have an Arctica with a K3, a Krios with a Falcon 3, and a K3 two Krios's with a Falcon 3 and Bio Quantum K3, and one Krios with a Falcon 3 and Bio Continuum K3. And for sample preparation, we have a VitraBot like a GP2 and a VitraJet that's undergoing internal validation, but will be offered to users once that's complete. Uh, while we're still under some on-site restrictions, we're offering one-on-one -on -one remote trainings and small remote workshops. And we hope to have visitors on site soon again um, to offer workshops for sample preparation and microscope operation. We hope to work with you soon. Thanks. Thanks, Theo and Mike. Hello, I'm Mike Schmidt, and I'm one of the co-directors of the uh, Stanford Slack Cryo EM Center. As for the other, as with the other two centers, we have um, access for high-end data collection and uh, training. We have three Creos microscopes with K3 and uh, and Falcon 4 cameras. 
Uh, some are equipped with with energy filters. We have the the normal selection of of sample preparation uh, equipment, and uh, we are currently having some uh, visitors on site for for in person training. Uh, we hope to have more people on on site very soon for uh, for both in in on site training and uh, to complement our remote access uh, data for data collection with with on site access for data collection. Um, please come and see us. Uh, the 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 website is there. Thank you. Now uh, I it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our our speaker for today, Ashish Manglik. Uh, Ashish received his bachelor's degree at uh, Washington University uh, in chemistry and biology, and while there received the, uh, the Spectre Award, he got his uh, PhD and MD at Stanford University, right here, uh, in uh, 2014 and 2016, um, and uh, he was working with, uh, in, in the labs of, uh, of Brian Kabilka and, uh, and George uh, Yorio Skiniotis. Uh, he has received several awards uh, for young and uh, and early investigator uh, awards from from Scientific American, from the National Institutes of Health, and from the International Narcotics Research Conference. Um, his his focus is on, as you'll see. Uh, cell signaling, especially the GPR system for cell signaling. Um, there are thousands of GPCR receptors, uh, most of which we don't know what they smell and after they smell it, what they do. So, um, so he's, uh, he, he's very in, in, in involved in figuring out this, these orphan receptors for which we do not know the, uh, their function. Uh, his talk today will be solving molecular puzzles in GPCR signaling with cryoEM. Uh, welcome, Ashish. Great, thank you, uh, Michael, for the introduction uh, and you know for giving me the chance to come talk here, and also for the attendees that have come. I must fully admit, at the beginning of this talk, that um, I personally am learning cryoEM really through um, a remarkable collaboration with Yifan Cheng's group. Um, as well as, you know, bolstered by uh, both the S2C2 Slack Stanford Cryom Center and the Pacific Northwest Cryom Center, as well as the UCSF Cryom Center. So, uh, you know, my background really is in structural biology, I trained as a crystallographer in Brian Kabilka's lab. And what I'll hopefully get across to you today is how Cryom has completely revolutionized our ability to peer into how GPCRs work. And I'll focus really on one system just to give you a sense for how, um, how quickly and how much more rapidly we're able to move compared to how, you know, where we were about five or six years ago. Um, so again, the title of my talk is Solving Molecular Puzzles in GPCR Signaling. And really what I view, um, you know, modern structural biology is able to do, instead of being an end in itself where we get, um, you know, the first high resolution view after someone's entire PhD or postdoctoral experience, the rate at which we, which we can get structures of GPCRs and signaling proteins is such that we can really start to fit in, uh, you know, many puzzle pieces at once. Uh, and, and really, um, it's not just, you know, the structure itself that we, that we get, but really gives us deep insight into the physiology or the biology of the system. So this talk will probably focus a lot more on the biology than the cryo-EM, mostly because um, that's really the perspective that, that my lab comes at it from. Okay, so what are we interested in? My lab is broadly interested in G-protein coupled receptors. And this very huge family of proteins um, are, are incredibly diverse. Uh, and they sit on the cell surface and recognize a whole host of stimuli. So everything from hormones, proteins, ion, pH, light, or even force itself can activate one of these receptors. Uh, and the really neat thing about this broad family is that each one of these receptors, while they're slightly diverse, has a kind of a common mechanism of activation where these receptors then change shape and go on to engage a whole host of intracellular signaling proteins and signaling cascades like the cyclic AMP pathway, calcium pathways, or growth factor pathways like the MAP kinase pathway. And uh, perhaps what's even more remarkable is that, you know, mammals encode thousands of GPCRs, about half of them are just specialized for olfaction, as Michael alluded to, but the rest of these G-protein coupled receptors control almost every aspect of physiology. So everything from neurotransmission, metabolism, feeding, uh, you know, you name it, um, is controlled by one of these receptors. And as a result, they've been perennially amazing drug targets for manipulating human physiology and restoring uh, physiology and, and, and disease. So with this kind of uh, importance in, in biology, biology and in medicine, it's no 
wonder that there's a lot of effort to understand how these receptors function at the, at the atomic level with the hopes that we can manipulate physiology more precisely. So what I'll focus on today is you know, um, not our work on many of these other physiological systems, but really focused on one specific signaling system that's deeply important in development and that goes awry in, uh, in, in certain cancers. And that's the hedgehog signaling pathway. Just to give you a little bit of background on hedgehog signaling, this is one of these core developmental pathways that was discovered almost now 40 years ago by pioneering studies by Christian uh, Nusselin Bohard and Eric Weishaus, uh, where they were looking at uh, you know, mutations that would uh, disrupt normal development of Drosophila embryos. And this is the cover of nature you know, from, from their pioneering studies, which showed that they could discover uh, mutations that would uh, disrupt this very normal segment segmentation of a developing Drosophila larvae. Again, here's a more, uh, more recent figure. So you can see, for example, there's these very clear um, repeating units that are really important for uh, determining certain axes for how the Drosophila uh, embryo develops. And the hedgehog mutant was named because it basically completely disrupted this, this very specific phenotype le leading to something that resembled this cute little furry animal or you know, in subsequent years, uh, uh, you know, the, the video game, uh, which, which some of you may have played. Okay, so what does hedgehog signaling practically do? This is just in Drosophila. Um, hedgehog signaling is deeply important in guiding the body plans of essentially all animals. So for example, just, you know, just to give you one example, um, if, if you're thinking about how does, do the cells in the developing, um, I have to do this on camera somehow, uh, you know, how, how does developing, how the cells of the developing limb bud figure out which side is gonna be the pinky or the thumb, it's actually a hedgehog gradient of this hormone that determines how that's gonna happen. In the same way, hedgehog gradients determine what's gonna end up becoming your head or your feet, what's gonna end up becoming um, your front and your back. All of this is uh, determined by hedgehog gradients in combination with a number of other morphogen gradients. And in adult tissues, when hedgehog, hedgehog signaling goes awry, uh, people develop perhaps the most common cancer in all of North America, or certainly in, in Europe and in, in the United States, which is basal cell carcinoma, as well as a number of other cancers that are driven by aberrant signaling of this pathway. Now, how does this pathway work? And this is really where we operate, which is we want to understand at atomic level detail a number of the puzzles that have remained despite you know, four decades or whatever of uh, beautiful genetics and a beautiful biochemistry and cell biology to understand how this pathway works. So what we know at this point is that there's a number of components involved. We know that there's a protein called patched that um, has very high homology to transporter-like molecules that um, putatively transports some sort of uh, sterol um, you know, and depletes it from the inner side of the, of the cellular membrane. And the constitutive activity of patch inhibits uh, a GPCR-like molecule called smoothin. Uh, and this is, what, this is uh, what keeps the pathway off. Now, when the hedgehog morphogen uh, comes along and binds patched, uh, it's proposed in that, that hedgehog inhibits whatever patched function is. This then releases the brakes on smoothin, and now smoothin turns on. And this activated smoothin uh, inhibits uh, the, the degradation of this transcription factor glee, allowing it to build up and then um, turn on a whole host of um, uh, transcription cascades uh, that are responsible for hedgehog signaling. So again, this is, you know, these parts are known, but really fundamentally what allows this communication to happen or how patch works remains very mysterious. And part of this uh, mystery lies in the fact that uh, there's a very intricate cell biological dance for all of these components. So for example, when the pathway is off, many of these components, for example, patch and, a, and another G protein coupled receptor, GPR161, exist in this very unique um, cellular membrane called the primary cilium. And when the pathway turns on, uh, patch is, has been shown to be moved out of the primary cilium, smooth and moves into the primary cilium. This receptor, GPR161, also leaves. So it's a very intricate dance that's happening. Uh, but at some level, all of this is controlled by very specific molecular interactions that have to happen. So a big goal that we have is to really understand, you know, what are, you know, fundamental puzzles in hedgehog signaling. So for example, um, it's still not 100% clear how patch at the basal level inhibits the function of smoothin. Um, even the molecular function of patch, while it's been proposed that it's a transporter, we don't have incontrovertible evidence that that's, that that's truly the case. Um, we still to this day don't really deeply understand or have a full understanding of how smoothin is activated and how it then triggers signaling cascades. And then finally, um, this orphan receptor, GPR161, um, while it's known that it's a really important negative regulator of the pathway, we have very little understanding of, of you know, what, uh, 
what manipulates its function uh, to, to serve as a regulator. So each one of these questions, you know, what we're hoping to do is um, to understand at a very deep mechanistic level. Uh, and, and in many ways, while we could go solve structures of many of these components, and some of these components, you know, have, have already been um, um, structurally characterized, really our hope is not just to understand structures, but to build bridges between structure and function. Uh, and, you know, this is obviously a, a beautiful picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if you live in San Francisco, like I do, uh, you know, perhaps you'll recognize that the Marin headlands are, uh, are even more beautiful. And, and if you'd like to get over, again, the analogy here is that um, um, perhaps the function side lives here and, you know, the structure is just, just, just plain old San Francisco. Okay, so, so, so if we think about this now from the terms, uh, from the perspective of structural biology, you know, what we're able to do pretty often in, in structural biology, I say cryo-EM, you know, while it's uh, an incredibly enabling technique is still um, uh, limited by this, is that our view on structural biology is limited to low energy states of signaling systems. You know, these are usually the stable states that are either crystallizable or I would say, you know, it, they're imageable. They're the ones that average together and that we can see in large numbers even when we do a cryo experiment. But really where biology happens, where signaling biology gets exciting and interesting is uh, our states that are actually responsible for transducing the signal or for states that are responsible for um, uh, transducing unique signals. And these states on average are unstable and dynamic. And as a result, they've resisted crystallography certainly, and even for cryo-EM, unless you're going through really extensive um, uh, methods of classification, it's going to be pretty rare that you uh, can see one of these states. So our approach to this has been a little bit unique in that we think that instead of trying to go, you know, collect enough images or collect enough crystal structures to go see one of these states eventually, perhaps we can find ways of actually stabilizing these states to actually image them or to crystallize them. And the idea here uh, is one that, um, you know, we employed quite a bit when I was in Brian Kabilka's lab, which is that if you have a very dynamic protein, like for example, a G-protein coupled receptor, perhaps you could identify an antibody fragment that recognizes that excited state of the protein, one of these active or intermediate states, and make it amenable to structural biology study. And this general idea, you know, found a lot of traction for, for, the, uh, for crystallographers. And we'd argue that it actually, again, enables us to build bridges between the structures that we can now solve much more rapidly by cryo-EM, but really what their functional relevance is. Now, just to give you a little primer on nanobodies, um, this is a structure of a conventional antibody. It's a pretty complicated molecule. It's composed of a heavy and a light chain, a heterodimeric protein. Um, and it turns out that camelids like alpaca or llama, or camels themselves, make these really cool miniature antibodies that are just comprised of the single immunoglobulin uh, domain of the heavy chain. Uh, but what's really cool about these miniature antibodies is that uh, similar to conventional antibodies that can recognize an almost infinite range of antigens. Uh, but on top of that, they're, si they're single little proteins that are ultra stable uh, and they're very similar to human antibodies. And, and you know, for therapeutic purposes, they're, they're, um, they're very easy to make and they're, and they're relatively cheap to make. Now, similar to conventional antibodies, which have about six very highly diverse loops that allow them to you know, lock onto a bunch of different antigens, nanobodies have three loops. But what's really unique about nanobody loops is that they can inject themselves deep into the crevices of proteins that are either the active sites or the functional you know, hearts of proteins. And as a result, they've served as really great ways of pushing and pulling on signaling systems. Now, in the past, most people have um, discovered nanobodies by actually immunizing uh, these large alpaca or llama. And in the past couple of years, working with Andy Kuz's lab at Harvard, we've developed a number of completely in vitro methods to discover nanobodies. So the idea here is that we start with um, very uh, large uh, repertoires of camelid nanobodies just to understand how, do, how does nature build nanobodies. And what we've done over time is build very um, complex libraries, about a billion uh, variants, billion unique nanobodies that we display on the surface of a yeast cell. So here, you know, I'm showing 10 or whatever nanobodies. The unique thing is that in each one of these yeast is a plasmid that encodes for the nanobody that's on the surface. Again, this library is about 10 to the ninth or a billion unique nanobodies. And what we can do is go into this library uh, and for any given protein that we're interested in, uh, we can uh, uh, do this kind of process. We can uh, basically uh, identify nanobodies that are specific to our protein by basically pulling on those yeasts that have a nanobody that binds to our protein, discarding all the rest, amplifying those yeasts, and then repeating the process. And for us, this takes about on the order of about two days to run this cycle once. 
we run the cycle about four or five times and, and thus are able to find nanobodies that, that are specific to uh, any protein that we desire. And importantly, we made this technology available for free to basically every non nonprofit group. And I think last time I checked, we've distributed this, our libraries to about 350 groups across the world. So with that, uh, our hope is to, again, understand the structural biology of the hedgehog signaling pathway and, 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 you know, in, in many cases, many other GPCR signaling pathways. But really our lens into this, and, and what I'll describe today is that we use these single domain antibodies or nanobodies to basically push and pull on these various systems to understand how they respond. And, and as a result, what we hope to do in the atomic level is, is understand how, um, as understand the structural biology of one of these proteins, uh, but then, uh, with functional studies, build bridges between a specific conformational state that we see and, uh, and a specific function uh, elicited by that conformation. Okay, so uh, let me dive into the first example of, of, uh, of our work. And that's uh, really to understand the function of this uh, protein called PATCH. Now, um, PATCH had been proposed uh, almost 20 years ago to catalytically influence the function of smoothing. And pretty early on, there was a proposal by Phil Beachy's group at Stanford that uh, Patch perhaps uh, sequestered a, a lipid modulator of smoothing. Um, and, and then the general model that's been proposed in the field is that Patch perhaps moves a sterol like cholesterol away from smoothing, and that's what keeps smoothing inactive. Now, over the past couple of years, the labs of um, Yan Ning, uh, Shakun Li and uh, Vladimir Korkov, along with Phil Beachy and Yifan Cheng, have determined a number of structures of patch. Uh, and some of these structures are patched alone. Some of them are with, um, with this uh, morphogen hedgehog bound. Um, and what these structures have generally revealed, of course, is the general topology of patch, which is, you know, which is uh, again, very consistent with the transporter-like molecule. Um, and they've also revealed how hedgehog binds to patch. And the model now is that um, hedgehog, you know, binds to this extracellular region of patch, but then there's this N-terminal bit of hedgehog that uh, goes, dives deep into patch, and the proposal has been that um, that hedge, that this little long bit of, uh, of hedgehog basically occludes the pathway whereby um, some sort of molecule that would be transiting patch um, uh, needs to move. But that doesn't fundamentally answer the question of whether patch is a transporter. Um, at a most basic level, you know, some of the really pioneering work by Oleg Jardetsky uh, and Peter Mitchell almost now, um, you know, 60, 60 or so odd years ago, suggests that for a transporter to be a transporter, fundamentally it has to complete a conformational cycle. Um, so it has to, you know, in a simple mode, you know, basically have to go from an outward open to an, to, to an inward open state or basically go through a complete conformational cycle in order to move some sort of substrate. Um, so we had a simple uh, idea on how to basically approach this, uh, approach this question of whether patch is a transporter. We wondered, could we develop a molecule that would trap patch in a single conformation? And uh, there are two possible outcomes. Um, one possible outcome is kind of like a G protein coupled receptor. We trap it in one, in, in one conformation that perhaps you trap it in an active or an inactive conformation that would lead to, to either pathway activation or inactivation. The other model is really consistent with the transporter, which is if we stabilize any conformation along a conformational cycle that would inhibit the function of this protein, if it's a transporter, and thereby uh, turn the pathway on again because of this double, uh, this double negative control of the pathway. Okay, so this is a project led by Yunxiao Zhang and, and Phil Bici's lab. And what Yunxiao ended up doing is using our nanobody library to find nanobodies that would bind to patch in only a specific conformation. So what he did is he started again with our nanobody library um, and he identified a, mut a mutant version of patch that was locked to be um, in a completely inactive state. So that was in incapable of uh, doing its, whatever its function, putative function is. And what he would do over multiple rounds of selection is identify nanobodies that were selective to this mutant form of patch uh, over the wild type form of patch. Ended up with about uh, 15 clones, but I'll tell you about one of them today. Now, really critical, one thing I forgot to mention is that really critical to this process is uh, an experiment that goes like this, which is um, what you Yunshan, what we've done subsequently a lot in the lab is uh, purify, for example, two different versions of the same protein. So in this case, uh, what, what Yunshan did is uh, he could purify a version of patch that um, in this case was inactive, you know, and that's in the green color, 
purify another version of PASH that's in this case the wild type protein in red. And then in order to find these very rare nanobodies that specifically bind to one conformation of PASH, what he does is uh, mixes these two proteins that are each labeled with a different fluorophore with a pool of yeast. And then he can do a simple uh, flow cytometry experiment where on the y-axis would be all the yeasts that are binding to conformation two, on the x-axis are all the yeasts that are binding to conformation uh, one. And then by simply drawing a, this red little gate and selecting out those clones, you can identify nanobodies that would be selective again to one conformation versus the other. So we did this process for patched again, and he identified a nanobody that binds to patched, binds only again to this, this mutant form of patch. Uh, and over multiple rounds of you know, further improving its affinity, was able to get a molecule that not only binds to patch, but turns the pathway on. So, um, so this is data from some signaling data. This on the y-axis is just whether the pathway turns on, and the x-axis is concentration. And the best clone here is in, the, in blue here, uh, which, uh, which basically in a dose-dependent manner turns the pathway on to about 80% uh, the activity of, 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 of hedgehog itself. We could also show kind of in a, an acute experiment that, you know, you could administer this kind of molecule in, in an animal and, and get pathway, uh, to get the pathway to turn on. So really bona fide, it's a bona fide um, patched, um, patched inactivator and, and, and pathway agonist. Okay, so, so again, our hope is to build bridges between function and structure and uh, working with Yifan Cheng's group, again, one of our very, one of my for, more early forays into cryo-EM, we were able to determine a cryo-EM structure of patched bound to this nanobody, which we call nanobody TI-23. Um, and what you can hopefully see here is that this nanobody binds an extracellular uh, uh, domain on unpatched. Um, and here again is the kind of ribbon diagram of it. Again, in these structures, similar to many other structures of patched that have previously been solved, we see a number of sterile-like uh, densities, again, suggesting very strongly suggesting that patched is a, is a sterile transporter. But here's where it gets really cool. When we compared where this nanobody binds to the binding site of hedgehog, we find that their interfaces are completely overlapping. That's what's being shown on the left here. So in blue again is hedgehog and yellow is this nanobody. And you can see that they both basically landed on the same interface. And I'll remind you that these selections that we did didn't, uh, we didn't use hedgehog as part of those selections. So really what happened there is that this conformational selection that we do with our yeast display allowed the yeast or the yeast library to identify an allosteric hotspot on patch. Okay, so what has this taught us? Um, now, if we compare the structures of patched on its own that have been solved previously, in this case by the Beachy lab, or patched bound to this nanobody, what we saw is that this critical region, uh, which we've turned to switch helix, has two different conformations, you know, pose one. Um, and uh, for patch alone and pose two when the nanobody binds. And now if we go back and look at all the structures of patch that have been previously solved, you know, either bound to hedgehog or not bound to hedgehog, what we see is that this switch helix is in two different conformations. And in fact, this actually doesn't correlate with hedgehog binding at all. So some of these structures in conformation A are bound to hedgehog, others are not, and, and, and same for conformation B, some are hedgehog bound or not. But um, so, so what we think is happening is that this nanobody stabilizes the switch helix in this specific conformation. And that this is associated with um, a constriction of this conduit and patch. Um, uh, that's right here. So again, in green here is a structure of patch, uh, a conduit and in, in patch uh, without any nanobody. And in, in blue here is uh, what happens when the nanobody binds. Again, this just reflects that switch helix moving, which basically then again creates a new caveat of constriction. So again, even in the absence of that long little lipidic, um, you, know, you know, tail of hedgehog, this nanobody by, by stabilizing a conformation of patch in this region is able to inactivate patch and turn the pathway on, which again really um, suggests even more strongly now that patch functions primarily as, uh, as a transporter and simply by changing the conformational ensemble of patch, uh, one's able to, uh, to influence its activity and thereby influence pathway activity. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of vignette of you know, how, we, how we're using uh, single domain antibodies or nanobodies to probe transporter function. What I'll tell you about now is our efforts to understand um, 
how the pathways turned on and understand this G-protein coupled receptor called smoothin. So there's still fundamental questions, um, or some fundamental questions that remain in the field. One of which is, how does patch actually regulate the activity of smoothin, uh, both at a distance, or you know, what does patch actually remove or, or, or sequester from smoothin to keep it off? And then fundamentally, once smoothin turns on, how does that activated stimulus then get transduced inside the cell? So um, we had a goal to try to understand, you know, early on, what is, you know, how does smoothin actually turn on? What is the active conformation of smoothin? And um, while there's now a number of structures of G-protein coupled receptors in the on and the off states, um, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a very poor perspective on this, this smoothin family of proteins, or what we call family F GPCRs, uh, and, and what their activation mechanism is. Uh, is. Now, one of the things that we've learned from a, a whole host of structural biology and biophysics, um, including a lot of spectroscopy work, is that G-protein coupled receptors are incredibly dynamic proteins, both in the off state, but also in the on state. While they're bound to agonists, what we know now is that they're uh, really quite conformationally complex. And, and, and if you think about this from, from kind of an energetics perspective, it's really the, pr the presence of a transducer molecule, like a G-protein or beta arrestin, that causes these receptors to become in one conformation. So in the absence of one of these transducers, these receptors explore many different conformations. And that's really what's made it um, very challenging to assess conformations of, uh, of G-protein coupled receptors. And I'd argue many other transmembrane signaling proteins in the app, in, you know, if, by simply doing structural biology. I think really what you need to do to understand these excited states is to, is to stabilize them uh, in some way. Now, in order to really understand smoothen function, uh, a couple of years ago, Ishan Deshpande in my lab um, uh, did a screen, a very similar screen to what I described previously for patch. Uh, but the, here, the idea was to again start with one of our nanobody libraries and then progressively select for nanobodies that would only bind to activated smoothen. So, here again, it's a very similar scheme, uh, but what Ishan did is uh, look for nanobodies that would bound, that, that would selectively recognize agonist occupied smoothin and would not bind uh, inactive or antagonist occupied smoothin. So you identified a number of clones, which we've subsequently characterized. Um, the first one, and this was you know, when we were far more adept at crystallography than, than cryo-EM, uh, we were able to get a structure of what X-ray crystallography. And this structure actually revealed quite a bit about how this pathway, uh, how, how this receptor turns on. Um, and it's published work, so I won't spend uh, a ton of time on it. Uh, but you know, here what I'm showing is uh, a structure of smoothened, uh, again, in an active conformation bound to uh, one of these nanobodies, in this case, nanobody smoothened eight, which binds to the bottom of this receptor and again, props it open and keeps it on. Uh, what we learned from the structure, uh, and that's, uh, you know, one of the more remarkable findings from this study, is that while activated smoothened again binds to the SAG, the synthetic agonist that we actually put in the mixture, uh, it actually also comes down with a cholesterol molecule that's deep inside the heart of smoothin. So the field previous to this had primarily believed that cholesterol binding to this extracellular site was important for function. And again, um, solving the, the, a, a structure of the activated conformation of the excited state in this case revealed a cholesterol bound deep in the heart of smoothin that's actually, we think, probably more important for how the pathway works and is really the, the cholesterol that patched probably sequesters away from smoothin. Now, at the same time, um, uh, you know, while, while we were focused on trying to get a crystal structure of, of, of an activated smooth end with one of these nanobodies, the labs of uh, Cheng Zhang and Shakun Li have, uh, have determined a structure of uh, cryo-EM structure of smooth end, in this case, bound to a heterotrimeric G protein of the GI class. Um, and uh, for those of you who have been following the, um, uh, the GPCR cryo field, you, you'll recognize that there's been an absolute revolution in the structural biology of G-protein coupled receptors uh, by cryo-EM over the past um, you know, four to five years. And that's really driven in part by uh, the remarkable ability to very rapidly generate complexes of GPCRs with heterotrimeric G-protein. So, in some of our own work led by um, uh, Antoine uh, Cole, uh, who was a graduate student at the time, uh, and, and, as well as when I was in the lab of Brian Kabilka and, and working with Yorgos Kiniotis, um, you know, what you can hopefully see you know, from this, from, even from this early work is that you know, a 2D class average of a GPCR bound to a G protein is, is pretty darn easy to, to analyze. You, know, you can see the receptor clearly there, different components of the G protein, 
there as well as an antibody fragment in this case that, that we discovered for this complex that's found a lot of use subsequently. Um, that then, you know, eventually gave rise to a pretty nice, a pretty reasonable 3D reconstruction to, to enable structural determination. And, and really, this remarkable revolution in, in structural biology for GPCRs by CryoM is driven by the fact that most GPCRs, by their, by their fundamental names, G protein coupled receptors, couple the G proteins. And if you can make this complex between a receptor and a G protein, this G protein essentially serves as a fiducial to drive alignment of the GPCR. So, um, so what, what we've seen very dramatically is a proliferation of structures of GPCRs bound to their G proteins. And this is, a, this is really exciting because it enables us to see uh, receptors you know, bound to agonists or bound to their endogenous hormones. But one of the big challenges is, um, uh, that still remains is, what if you want to determine structures of G protein coupled receptors in their off states? And really, if you want to understand how proteins function, uh, uh, you, know, you really need to understand uh, multiple conformations in order to understand really what drives um, um, changes in conformation. So this has still been perplexing. And, and one, part of the reason why this has been challenging is because uh, like, like many other very small membrane proteins, G protein coupled receptors have almost no extracellular or intracellular real estate that sticks out of the micelle or out of, out of, a, out of a, uh, uh, you know, a nanodisc. And as a result, it's very hard to drive particle alignment, both from a size perspective, but also from the fact that um, um, these, these particles are essentially um, spherical. So um, we've been also uh, pondering and working on um, using our single domain antibodies to essentially serve as fiducials for, um, for inactive state structures of G-protein coupled receptors. And this is not a new idea. You know, people have proposed this um, um, quite some time ago and you know, Yifan Chang, uh, our main collaborator in all this work has proposed that you know, using antibody fragments or FAB fragments for small memory proteins may function as far as you know, a decade or so ago. But we wondered whether um, we could use, again, these, these nanobodies that were coming out of our screens and determine structures of, uh, of G-protein coupled receptors uh, with the hopes that perhaps, again, we could use um, structures of these nanobodies bound to their targets to build bridges between um, a conformation that we could observe and a, and a function in, in a cellular context. So again, going back to this original screen that, that uh, Ishan and my lab did, uh, a different nanobody that he found from this screen uh, we've worked up now uh, and, and this is a pretty curious nanobody. We call it nanobody smooth in 12. And what's really unique about this nanobody is that it's actually a partial agonist of the pathway. This is pretty rare. It turns out that finding antibody modulators or antibody, signaling modulators of G-protein coupled receptors is a, so it remains a pretty challenging feat. And what, Ifan, uh, what Ishan has uh, um, found is that this nanobody can, on its own, very weakly turn the pathway on. So what you're seeing again on the y-axis is just whether the pathway is on or not and on the x-axis of the dose response of, of this nanobody. We know that it's a partial agonist because if we fully turn the pathway on with hedgehog and then dose in the nanobody, we see a decrease uh, in signaling back down to this um, you know, 25 or 20% level. So that's really um, very convincingly suggests that, that this nanobody, by doing whatever it does, clamps uh, signaling at a very specific level in, in, in the pathway. So we wondered, how does this nanobody actually do that? And, um, and I'll be honest, you know, when Ishan and my lab, working with Brian Faust, another graduate student, um, wanted to approach this by cryo uh, you know, I, I really didn't think this was going to work. And I'll also say that, you know, we'd spent quite a bit of time getting a structure of nanobody 12 bound to, uh, to smoothen uh, by extra crystallography with a maximal resolution that we were able to attain of about 3.8 angstroms. Uh, and, you know, well, that was probably good enough. We probably didn't need a better structure than that. Uh, and what's really remarkable is that, um, you know, I think on their first try, Ishan and Brian working with, um, you know, the, uh, the S2C2 center, were able to get a structure of, um, of smoothened bound to just this, uh, this nanobody. So again, in green here is uh, the seven transmembrane domain of smoothened, which is a little bit of the extracellular region. And in uh, orange here is uh, this nanobody. Just to give you some kind of statistics, you know, this is a pretty small memory protein complex of only about 75 kilodaltons. I'd wager that the structured part is probably even smaller, probably approaching about 50 or 60 kilodaltons. Uh, and the overall, you know, kind of nominal resolution of this, of this structure is really quite good, uh, about 2.8 angstrom resolution. Um, so um, just a couple of other highlights, if we can get to the next slide. Um, uh, this structure was solved with um, 
with a pretty high affinity antagonist called SNAMPT1, uh, discovered again in Phil Beachy's lab about 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and what's remarkable to me is that, you know, this, this structure with just this nanobody has a pretty uh, good uh, uh, density for, uh, for this molecule so that's sufficient that it's completely unambiguous uh, to resolve it. And for us, uh, in other parts of our, our work in the lab, we're very interested in using, uh, you know, structures to, to discover new small molecule modulators. And uh, this is a very exciting space for us because uh, in the past, it's been very challenging to crystallize GPCRs with low affinity uh, molecules. And, and we're hopeful that uh, the ability to get a cryo -AM structure of, of smoothen with this nanobody, you know, relatively easily may enable us to now actually go discover new molecules and, and, and see how they bind, especially low affinity molecules that are pretty, uh, you know, early hits in a campaign. Now, the other exciting thing about this specific nanobody is that uh, I told you this nanobody is a partial agonist and in many ways it actually behaves as an inhibitor uh, in, in a more endogenous, um, system, in more endogenous signaling uh, uh, systems. And when we map the interface of this nanobody on the smooth end, which is again shown in these orange, um, in this orange cartoon here against a the surface of smooth end, which is colored by conservation, what we see is that parts of this nanobody engage pretty highly conserved regions of smooth end. And the reason why we think this is great and, and pretty exciting is that um, there's a lot of interest in developing smooth end inhibitors for uh, a variety of cancers, but a subset of those patients that take smooth end inhibitors develop resistance uh, to, uh, to the inhibitors that, uh, that have thus far, far been developed. So the exciting thing is that this nanobody targets a completely new allosteric site that hasn't been described to date. Uh, and we think that perhaps um, targeting this new site may be a great way of overcoming uh, the resistance that's been observed in the clinic thus far. Okay, so um, I told you now about, you know, uh, a couple of small mysteries that we've solved. I, you know, we've worked a little bit on how patch actually functions. Uh, a lot of work uh, that we've dedicated to understanding how smoothened is activated, both at the level of, you know, what, is a what are the conformational changes in smoothened that occur upon, upon a pathway activation and how can uh, new, uh, you know, poorly described allosteric sites impinge on pathway activity uh, with some exciting results perhaps uh, uh, for using you know, very small membrane protein fiducials to drive uh, particle alignment. The last thing I wanted to highlight uh, that's again all unpublished work um, is our work to try to understand an important negative regulator of the pathway. This is a molecule called GPR-161. And um, about um, eight or so years ago, um, the, uh, the lab of Peter Jackson at Stanford and, and really um, Saiket um, Mukhopadhyay um, discovered that this, that this orphan receptor GPR-161 is a really important negative regulator of the pathway. And the way that this works um, is that when the pathway is off, GPR-161 constitutively turns on the GS signaling pathway to keep the pathway off. And then when hedgehog signaling turns on, when, when the hedgehog uh, morphogens uh, present, GPR-161 has to leave the primary psyllium in, in order for the pathway to turn on. So um, while it's clear that GPR-161 is a very important part of the pathway, uh, it's been very unclear what actually controls GPR-161 activity. And it's been proposed that you know, GPR-161 is a constitutively active GPCR. Uh, but more broadly, uh, you know, one of the things that's really unique about the GPCR, uh, about, the G about all GPCRs, is that there's about 100 or so GPCRs for which we have absolutely no idea what their endogenous ligands are. So this is a, a nice, on the left here is a nice um, uh, dendrogram from the GPCRDB um, that highlights, uh, you know, major classes, all major classes of G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, and on the bottom left, this kind of big group here are all of the class A or uh, receptors. Now, uh, out of all of these orphan receptors, is basically only one that's been structurally characterized today. And that's one of the big challenges is, you know, if you don't have a stimulus, if you don't know what the stimulus for a receptor is, um, it's very hard to go characterize it both at the cell biological level or the physiological levels, but also at the structural biology level. It's very hard to understand, um, um, it, you know, how a receptor functions. So um, we've started to develop new biochemical approaches to purify orphan receptors and to start to work with them with the hopes that we can use biochemistry and perhaps even structural biology as a way of, uh, as, you know, a kind of a completely orthogonal way of getting into how orphan receptors function. Uh, and for GPR-161, we've had a, a pretty exciting early success. Um, so, um, you know, Ishan Deshpande, again, in my lab, working with uh, a really talented uh, rotation student, Simone Harrison, another graduate student in my lab, Nick Hoppe, uh, were able to, you know, purify GPR-161, again, bound to 
uh, in this case, the GS, this is a type of GS heterotrimeric G protein, and one of these nanobodies that uh, the Cabilca lab had developed many years ago to kind of lock everything together. Uh, and we're able to, again, with working with the Stanford S2C2 Center, determine a pretty reasonably good cryo-EM structure of, of GPR161, again, bound to uh, its G protein. Now, the structure has revealed um, a few very interesting highlights. The first is um, if we look at the extracellular side of the receptor where a, a stimulus normally would be, what we note is that, uh, let me get this thing to play well. Um, uh, okay, there we go. So um, what we note is that uh, what I've highlighted in red here is that the extracellular loop two of this receptor folds down on top of itself. Uh, and what we, think this re what we think is happening here is that this receptor um, has basically become self-activating and there's a little bit of precedence for this kind of concept from, for another orphan receptor. Um, in that in order uh, for, for this receptor to function, what it basically does is um, in the absence of any kind of exogenous stimulus, uh, this loop folds down on itself and basically keeps this receptor constitutively active. But on top of that, another really exciting thing that the structure has revealed is that um, we observe a, a mystery density that's consistent with a sterile kind of appended to the side of this receptor. And if we look at all of the uh, amino acids that surround this sterile, they're highly conserved all the way down to echinoderms, uh, which again suggests that, uh, that we've potentially uncovered another sterile regulated receptor in this pathway. Uh, and, and again, uh, this opens a new frame to try to understand how sterols regulate uh, hedgehog signaling biology. So again, this, is, this project is at a very early stage, uh, but we're hopeful that you know, with, uh, with having identified this, uh, this potentially uh, new modulator, we might be able to really understand how GPR-161 um, controls hedgehog signaling. Okay, so um, with that, I'll, I'll kind of uh, start to sum summarize. Uh, we think we're at a very unique time in, in structural biology, certainly for the GPCR field, in which our ability to gain structures, um, you know, far outpaces our ability to understand what they actually mean. Um, and what this has led to is that structural biology for us has largely become not an end in itself, but really a means to see something for the first time and ask, you know, what is the relevant function of it? And certainly for orphan receptors, we're finding this more commonly that, you know, we make observations for in new structures and, and often that actually reveals new biology. Uh, a big push for us remains to try to build bridges between structural biology and, and function, both in the context of cellular biology, but, but also um, um, physiology. And, and, and for us, these antibody fragments are really a great way of doing that for probing structure at the atomic level, <coughs> but also interrogating what they do functionally to understand what, what, their role, what the role of that confirmation is in physiology or cell biology. So with that, I'll, I'll acknowledge again some of the key people that have enabled all of this work. Um, almost all of our cryo-EM work is done in deep collaboration with Yifan Cheng's group has been deeply generous in, um, in almost every aspect, both training uh, members of my group, you know, uh, jointly advising a student, in this case, Brian Faust, who's again, led a lot of the effort here. Almost all of the hedgehog biology work in my lab in some ways led by a really talented uh, postdoctoral fellow, Ishan Deshpande, and, and Nick Hoppe has been, uh, a really remarkable graduate student working at the interface of trying to understand orphan receptors and, and also using cryo-EM. We have a really remarkable lab of, uh, of, of trainees that are, um, you know, uh, willing to work on pretty challenging projects. And, uh, you know, all of our hedgehog work is done in collaboration with uh, Phil Beachy's lab at Stanford and Ben Myers, who's uh, now at the University of Utah. Um, uh, Yu Xiao Zheng's work I already talked about, and one person I didn't get a chance to talk about is Kai Hua Zheng who's a uh, postdoc fellow in, in Yifan Cheng's group and has done really beautiful work on, on hedgehog signaling as well. All of our nanobody work is done in collaboration with Andy Cruz's lab and his uh, postdoctoral fellow, Connor McMahon. Uh, and um, you know, we're obviously very grateful for a variety of funding sources, but for this audience, what I'll, what I'll give you know, a couple of key shout outs to, uh, you know, the UCSF Cryon facilities has been incredibly helpful, David Bulkley in particular, but really access to a number of uh, Cryo-EM centers, both the Stanford Slack S2C2 Center, which is responsible for a lot of this work, uh, as well as the PNCC Center, for which um, uh, we've been able to get amazing data, but is work on a completely different project, as well as the NCI Cryo-EM facility. All of these um, national facilities have really enabled us to, to get data at a rate that um, really I, I couldn't have imagined a couple of years ago. So uh, really 
uh, want, want to thank all these groups for, for making these resources so available and for the training and uh, just the expediency of being able to get collect data at, at these sites. So with that, I'll stop and, and, and take questions if there are any, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nam Nguyen. Uh, can you please comment on why is it possible to determine the structure of smoothened in complex with the NB SMO12 uh, nanobody to such high resolution, but not a GPCR with an ICL3 fusion? Yeah, great question. So for those of you who are uh, not, perhaps not familiar with um, what an ICL3 fusion is, one of the strategies that had worked incredibly well for the crystallography era of determining GPCR structures is um, that instead of um, trying to develop antibody fragments to, to enable crystallography, um, what many groups did is, and this is really again pioneering work by, in the Kabilka lab, is to basically create a fusion protein into the intercellular loop of a GPCR. and, and Really, the primary thing that that, that that fusion led to, it was the ability to form crystal lattice contacts that then enabled us to, to get crystal structures. And the challenge with ICL3 fusions is that, you know, there's basically two points of attachment. So getting that entire thing to be rigid where the, the mass of the, of the fusion protein is driving alignment of the, of the GPCR uh, is really quite challenging. And in, in my lab, you know, we've tried this quite a bit. It's worked to some extent, you know, we've heard rumors where this has worked a little bit better for others. Um, so, so it's so it kind of you know it's a very bespoke um, thing for each specific project. I think the reason why this nanobody approach works really well is because almost all of the mass is very rigidly coupled to a three-dimensional epitope on a protein, and that's why um, um, uh, you know we think that it basically drives particle alignment so well. And you know, there's great examples of this not just for GPCRs now, but for a number of other transporters, and certainly you know great examples of using full FAB fragments. Uh, as well to drive particle alignment. So we think it's really a complex three-dimensional epitope that, that, that enables this. Uh, thank you. I had a question about the, uh, the, the comparison of the hedgehog binding, hedgehog binding to, the, um, uh, to, to the nanobody binding. Uh, and you say that the, the uh, constriction is driven by the movement of a helix in, in um, patched itself, rather than any obstruction that's introduced by hedgehog uh, itself, like that long tail you, you originally pointed to um, as, as something that was kind of a, 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 a candidate for that. Uh, can you then look at what parts of hedgehog uh, are disposable uh, that you don't have to have that long tail as long as you have something that moves that uh, that uh, that helix up to that position of that uh, the, in there. It, it, does it give you uh, more insight into what what parts of hedgehog really were important? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. I think I probably misspoke or spoke too fast when I was talking about this. So. What the field has um, done, Michael, is a version of that experiment. They basically chopped up hedgehog and tried to figure out, you know, what is the business end of hedgehog? And what they've actually found is that this, that this peptide that digs deep into hedgehog is actually the most important part for, for inhibiting the function of patch. And in fact, this, this region that binds up here is important for affinity, but it's actually dispensable for, for the activity of hedgehog. So, um, you know, that's why I think our study is, it kind of flips that logic on its head. It's not just that 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 lipid part that blocking the conduit is important. You can actually block the function of patch, not just by plugging the conduit, but by hysterically preventing its, its conformational transitions. So, hmm. so it's, you know, hedgehog itself actually probably doesn't necessarily um, um, limit this, uh, this switch helix movement in the same way that the nanobody does. Because, you know, what we see is that the nanobody really stabilizes one pose of the switch helix Whereas um, in the prior structures of patch that have been solved, um, you know, some of these red conformations or blue conformations are, are both, you know, when hedgehog binds, the switch, the switch helix has been observed in both states. So clearly mm -hmm. hedgehog probably doesn't influence the conformation of this helix, but our nanobody just by impinging on this helix is able to recapitulate what hedgehog does in a very different way, we think. Thank you. We have another question. Is it possible to form trimeric complex with B2 ARGS without ligand in the purified system? If so, 
the GPR 161 being self-activating might not be unique? That's the question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it, it, you know, the, the biochemistry of whether you can form a trimeric complex and whether it's stable enough is, is uh, it, you know, remains to be done. So I think I actually have done that specific experiment that Sung Su Yu is asking for at some point in graduate school. And I think that the answer is yes, you actually can form a complex even in the absence of an agonist. Uh, it's not a very stable complex, but it can be formed and probably if one really desired to image it probably could be imaged. We think that the GPR-161 self-activating you know, feature is, is unique because um, we don't see this, uh, this, if I could go back to that slide easily. Um, uh, I'll have to play the darn movie. Hopefully it sticks for a second. Um, we don't, we, for most GPCRs, we don't see this kind of, um, let's see, uh, you know, this extracellular loop actually diving deep and occupying the same region that an agonist would occupy. So we think that, you know, we think it's self-activating, um, uh, not because we can form this complex, but because of uh, the fact that this loop actually takes up the same space where normally an agonist would sit. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Paula Flicker. Uh, you are using nanodisks for the EM in, in these cases, correct? Uh, Paula, that's a great question. And, and I, I'm slightly embarrassed to admit that most of this work is actually with detergents. So we're in the GPCR field, unfortunately, has been a little bit slow to adopt um, um, uh, nanodisks. And that's, that's, that's partly because, um, you know, in the past, uh, you know, when I was in Brian Kabilka's lab, this is again, work really led by Antoine Cole, uh, uh, working with Virgo Skiniotis, we tried for a very long time finding an ideal detergent, an ideal um, set up to do cryo-EM for GPCRs. And we landed on was a very specific mixture of, uh, of two detergents that's really, you know, and it's been incredibly enabling uh, for the entire field to get structures of GPCR G protein complexes. Um, so mostly for reasons of expediency, we haven't gone back and done really careful work with, with nanodisks. My lab is slowly moving, you know, to using nanodisks as a couple of great examples out of um, uh, Gerhard Wagner's lab, as well as, you know, working with Alan Brown, as well as um, Dan Rosenbaum's lab and structures of GPCRs now in nanodisks. But by and large, that, you know, still hasn't caught on in the field as kind of the, the de facto mode of, of getting these structures. But, but great question and something that, um, you know, we're striving towards. If, um, if I can ask a quick question. So you maybe touched on this, um, uh, going back to your nanobody 12 smoothened structure, um, you said the connection was was not very flexible. So I was wondering if you could speak to sort of local resolution, um, given you're using that nanobody as a fiducial, um, does it look good in that particular structure? And then given you've now looked at a couple of things, are there any trends in terms of local resolution when you're using these nanobodies as fiducials? Yeah, so we, I will say that we, this is the only example that we've gotten. We, this has emboldened us to do more nanobody driven fiducial. You know, I, I really, um, and this work is very hot off the press. I think we only got the structure about three or four weeks or maybe six weeks ago. Um, we are now emboldened to try other nanobodies that we've discovered over many years and, and to see if they're sufficient to drive particle alignment of GPCRs. My gut feeling is that because um, you know, the center of mass of this nanobody is not that far away from kind of the center of mass of GPCR that we won't get these like very profound local resolution problems. For the G protein complexes, this has actually been a problem for the field where um, a lot of the center of mass of the G protein is, you know, drives particle alignment for the G protein and you get these beautiful um, high resolution uh, views of the G protein, which are basically the same for every GPCR complex. And then, you know, the part that you care a lot about, which is a drug binding pocket has, has you know, just abysmal resolution and, and you, you just can't even see what you care about the most. Um, so we think that, you know, th this nanobody approach certainly, um, you know, will hopefully have less of that. But then again, we don't know how, um, um, how successful this will be over many different receptors and many different nanobodies. This might just be an, extra, you know, an edge case or it could be, um, you know, more common. Well, we're at time, actually. So um, if there are any burning questions, people can type them in. But uh, most people probably have somewhere to run off to. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Ashish. That was really gorgeous maps <laughs> that we saw there. Um, and um, we hope everyone joins us again. Um, 
at, a, at another one of these seminars. And, um, you know, from the CryoEM centers, please let us know how we can help you. And hopefully we will see you again. Thank you, Ashish. Thanks a lot, everyone. Mm -hmm.